The last two centuries have been a period of incredible advancement for our species. This period, barely a footnote in our grand chronicle, has seen more technological progress than the rest of human history combined. The keystone of this progress has been the experiment. A clever sort has an idea, tries it out, and if they're lucky, humanity ratchets forward by another notch. Yet the course of scientific progress has not always been a smooth one. For every successful experiment, many more fail, their hypothesis is being found wanting, and uh, their promises remaining unfulfilled. This is the natural order of things. The trial an error that is the lifeblood of science. Failure is but a stepping stone over the river of progress. However, there is another curious category of experiments. The ones that make you scratch your head and ponder, well, why? Why would you do that? The ones with a premise so bizarre, a goal so abstract, and a mythology so macabre that they can only be described as weird regardless of whether or not they were actually successful. So let's look at some of them, shall we? Better to start on our endeavor into science's eyebrow raising excesses than the time that scientists lace an elephant with psychotropic drugs. This study, uh, which occurred in 1962, was undertaken by researchers from the University of Oklahoma. It started with a seemingly well intentioned objective to understand a behavioral anomaly in elephants known as musk, a period of heightened aggression and erratic behavior during their mating season. The protagonists of this particular plot were a 14 year old Indian elephant named Tusco and a team of scientists led by Dr. Lewis West. They began by attempting to replicate the musk phenomenon in a controlled setting, with their tool of choice being the potent psychedelic substance lysergic acid diethylamide, better known by its shorter and catchier street name of LSD. This decision was premised on its personality disrupting effects, which they anticipated would mirror the unpredictable mask behavior. The LSD administration was a daunting task because whereas humans know to begin with a cheeky quarter tab and see how we get on, or so we hear anyway, there were no established dosage for animals as large as elephants, and so determining the optimal dosage required careful deliberation. LSD is known for its extreme potency, with doses as low as 0.02 to 0.03 milligrams per kilogram of body weight capable of inducing hallucinations in humans. However, in an audacious move, the researchers decided to start big and opted for a dosage of 297 milligrams of LSD for Tusco, equivalent to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. This dosage was predicated on their assumption that elephants would exhibit a lower sensitivity to LSD, despite its overdose potential in humans. As a result of this shooting from the hips guesswork, the experiment took a disastrous turn, because shortly after LSD administration, Tusco collapsed and started convulsing, clear signs of an overdose. Shocking, we know. The researchers hastily tried to counteract the dose by injecting the elephant with promazine, an antipsychotic drug, and pentobarbital, a barbiturate. Unfortunately, despite their elephants, Tusco did not recover and tragically died. This disaster did not escape the public's attention, especially as Tusco was a much loved and publicly known zoo animal. The media coverage amplified the criticisms about the unethical aspects of the experiment, questioning the use of such a high initial dose of LSD and a perceived lack of sufficient preparation for treating an overdose. The ill fated experiment also left a profound impact on the scientific community. It exposed the dangers of reckless drug administration and emphasized the importance of careful planning in such experiments. Furthermore, it also shed light on the need for more stringent ethical standards standards in animal research, and as a result, regulations for the use of LSD tightened. Unfortunately, Dr. West would eventually fall in with an organization with little regard for pesky things like laws and ethics. And that would be the CIA. His experiment with Tusco may have led him to becoming something of a pariah, but it also made him the perfect recruit for the infamous MK Ultra program, a CIA backed project exploring mind control and possibilities of the use of LSD. Here, his cavalier attitude to drug use was actually valued, and he would go on to become the architect of even greater LSD related atrocities. Ultimately, the LSD elephant experiment serves as a grim testament to the potential pitfalls of scientific exploration when ethical boundaries are. Uh, overlooked, or some could just say ignored. But let's move on now from one animal atrocity to another. The Soviet two-headed dog experiments, which I promise you are a real thing somehow. So, Vladimir Demikhov is a name that resonates in the annals of scientific history. He was a Soviet scientist known for his groundbreaking, yet 
profoundly unsettling experiment in organ transplantation, which led to the creation of two-headed dogs. Born in 1916, Demikov was a biomedical scientist with an unorthodox vision that saw beyond the medical conventions of his time and apparently beyond ethics. He believed in the possibility of transplanting vital organs, an idea which was revolutionary, yet perceived as far-fetched during the 1940s and 50s. This audacious objective required him to push the boundaries of medical ethics, often causing unease and concern among his contemporaries and indeed the wider public. That's what happens when you make two-headed dogs. He conducted many transplant experiments in his day, but the one that would etch his name in the annals of biomedical history involved surgically grafting the head and forelegs of a dog onto the body of another dog. The aim was to observe the feasibility and implications of such a transplant, not only from a surgical perspective, but also in terms of the psychological responses of the host organism. The procedure would begin with Demikov selecting two healthy dogs of different sizes. The smaller one, which would provide the additional head, was anesthetized, its head and upper body carefully severed at the shoulders. In an act of unparalleled precision, Demikov would then meticulously connect the major blood vessels and windpipe of the smaller dog's head to the larger host dog. Despite the primitive surgical tools and rudimentary knowledge of the time, Demikov managed to maintain sufficient blood flow to the smaller dog's head, keeping it alive during the course of the procedure. Following the operation, the grafted head would awaken, responding to the world around it with palpable awareness. It would blink, pant, lap at water, and even bare its teeth, behaviors that were profoundly disturbing and yet also compellingly fascinating. These dog duos lived anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks, their demise ultimately brought about by the immune response of the host dog rejecting the grafted tissue. Demikov carried out this procedure multiple times, creating 20 two-headed dogs over the span of 15 years. The experiments, though scientifically groundbreaking, were met with widespread criticism and for good reason. The distress caused to the animals was profound, and many argued that the short survival span of the grafts rendered the experiments more cruel than scientifically valuable. But it can't be denied. Demikov's work, while ethically contentious, significantly advanced the understanding of organ transplantation. His efforts, particularly with the issue of tissue rejection, laid the groundwork for subsequent breakthroughs in the field, including the world's first human heart transplant by Dr. Christian Bernard in 1967. This makes Demikov's legacy a complicated one, as his work is a complex fusion of scientific progress and haunting ethical questions. The two-headed dogs, discomforting as their images may be, directly contributed to the saving of many thousands of lives in our time by ratcheting humankind ever closer to successful organ transplant techniques. Was it a price worth paying? Well, that's something that only you can answer. So, tragically, dogs are a bit of a recurring theme in today's video, with our next example being their use by one Dr. Robert E. Cornish in 1934. Cornish, a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, found himself ensnared in an audacious ambition to bridge the insurmountable chasm separating life and death. <laughs> Ambitious guy, this doctor. Supposedly, his use of dogs rather than humans was a conscious choice intended to sidestep the greater ethical morass of experimenting on people. In what was a grim nod to the biblical tale of resuscitation, he named his test subjects Lazarus after the man whom Jesus brought back from the dead. The procedures for these experiments, despite their morbid underpinnings, were remarkably fastidious in their planning and execution. Each experiment began with the unfortunate subject being euthanized via an ether overdose. This method ensured no physical harm was inflicted upon their bodies. Once death was confirmed, the true crux of the experiment commenced. The deceased dog was placed on a teeterboard, a simple seesaw-like device that rocked the body back and forth. This mimics the circulation of blood. Concurrently, Cornish administered a cocktail of adrenaline and anticoagulants into the corpse, pharmaceutical agents designed to resuscitate the heart and prevent blood clotting. In Cornish's detailed records, he described that several Lazarus dogs reportedly regained consciousness, but their return to life was tragically far from perfect. Their movements were erratic and uncoordinated, and their behaviors were severely abnormal. Many exhibited blindness and couldn't stand or eat. Their disorientation and lack of typical response to stimuli suggested significant brain damage, presumably due to an insufficient oxygen supply during the revival process. Their resurrections were also tragically brief, only surviving for a few hours or days following the procedure. Despite the obvious drawbacks, Cornish enthusiastically proclaimed these experiments as successes. He posited them as groundbreaking feats, pioneering the path forward, reversing death's finality. Yet to his peers and contemporaries, the Lazarus experiments were nothing short of a macabre travesty. Animal rights activists were rightfully outraged, and his colleagues, aghast at the ethical ramifications, distanced themselves. 
The outcry was sufficiently deafening to result in his expulsion from Berkeley. Yet, in another astonishing twist, Cornish's expulsion seemed only to fuel his audacity. Unperturbed by societal censure, he openly advocated for escalating his experiments to human subjects. His desire for his next Lazarus found a potential volunteer in Thomas McMonagall, a death row inmate willing to bequeath his body post-execution. However, the state of California swiftly intervened, quashing any possibility of such an ethically contentious endeavor. Cornish's scientific journey was indeed an exploration into the intellectual abyss, with his ambitions pushing him into ethically contentious territories. While his daring did yield observations that contributed to developing modern CPR techniques, the controversy surrounding his work largely overshadowed these achievements. In reflecting upon the Lazarus experiments, we're led to question the ethics of scientific ambition. While there is no doubt that Cornish's work was a flagrant violation of animal rights with its cruel, bizarre practices, it is also crucial to recognize the long-term benefits yielded. It helped lay the groundwork for modern CPR, potentially saving countless lives. But can these later advances justify that initial cruelty? Can the ends validate the means? Every so often, a scientific myth bubbles to the surface, like that of French chemist Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier's alleged blinking experiment during his beheading. You probably know the one, the one where he supposedly blinked after his beheading to record how long he remained conscious for. Mesmerizing as the tale is, there is oh, one slight issue with it. It simply isn't true. His execution took place during the height of the revolutionary French terror, when people were being executed on an industrial scale, with 28 people being executed in Loasio's session alone, and all in barely 35 minutes. Amidst this pandemonium, who would have had the time to conduct such an experiment, even if they were permitted to do so by the powers that be? But fear not, dear viewers, because while that famous instance might be utter nonsense, there was one that was very, very real. It all happens on the cold morning of the 28th of June 1905, when a convicted murderer named Henri Lagoire awaited his fate under the blade of the guillotine. In the crowd was one Dr. Gabriel Barreau, who wanted to study the persistence of consciousness after decapitation, just as Lavoisier mythically had before him. Barreau's experiment was not some impulsive thing he had cooked up in the heat of the moment. Instead, it was a scientific investigation built on a morbid but intellectual curiosity about death and consciousness that had consumed him for his entire life. It wasn't the first hypothesis about consciousness following betting either. The curiosity had been prevalent since the dawn of executions. What made his study particularly striking, however, was his attempt to verify these suppositions under the scrutiny of a modern methodical approach. The plan was a simple one. Just like in the legend, Languille was to blink for as long as he could after his beheading, and the time would be recorded. After the blade fell and Languille's head rolled into the basket, Barreau bent in to observe, and surely enough, Languille's eyes fluttered open. But there was something more than that going on. It didn't just appear to be a reflex, a fading brain sending dull commands to its eyes, but rather it appeared as though Langlois was actually still fully conscious. His eyes seemed to focus and darted to meet the doctor's gaze. He called Langlois' name, and twice the eyes orientated towards him, seemingly reacting. This bizarre interaction lasted for several seconds before the eyelids drooped and consciousness began to fade. The experiment was considered a roaring success, and it consequently sparked extensive discussion about human consciousness and its relation to the physical body. Does the brain die instantly following decapitation, or does it linger in a terrifying state of disembodied awareness? These questions nagged at the scientific and philosophical communities alike, prompting further exploration into consciousness and death. It's important to note that Barreau's experiment was not without controversy and critique. Critics pointed out that the perceived awareness could simply be post-mortem reflexes or involuntary muscle movements, not consciousness, with Burroughs' willingness to find results making his mind see things that simply didn't happen. Moreover, the ethical implications of the experiment were a point of great contention, even with the subject of the experiment being a man who was destined for death who fully consented to the experiment. Despite this, Burroughs' observations remain some of the most detailed accounts of post-decapitation activity, and they're valuable to this day. Interestingly, despite Burroughs' experiments having occurred over a century ago, we are still no closer to coming to a concrete answer on the matter of post-decapitation consciousness. Modern medicine knows, beyond doubt, that the brain can survive for a brief period following the cessation of blood flow. However, whether the decapitated head retains consciousness, awareness, or any form of sentience is thought to still be a matter of speculation and conjecture, with today's scientific community largely leaning towards skepticism due to the lack of replicable empirical evidence that has emerged in the century since. If nothing else, Burroughs' experiment stands as an eerie testament to humanity's pursuit of knowledge in all situations, even at the precipice of death. It reminds us of our relentless curiosity to comprehend the unknown, no matter how disquieting, 
And of course, if nothing else, while this investigation didn't resolve the debate about consciousness after decapitation, it did cement a place in the annals of bizarre scientific history, a tale of ghoulish fascination that resonates in our collective memory to this day. Our final weird experiment takes us into the mind of one Werner Forsmann, a German researcher and physician from Berlin. His audacious self-experiment, which the title made apparent, involved stabbing himself in the heart, and it's been etched into the annals of history, not merely for its boldness, but also for revolutionizing cardiology. Forsmann was no quack, like some of the people we've seen today. Born in 1904, he was a bright lad from the very start, and pursued his medical education with fervor and curiosity. An initial inclination towards urology eventually gave way to cardiology during a residency at the August Victoria Hospital in Berlin, and so the stage was set for the experiment that would make him famous. Forsman hypothesized that a catheter could be inserted directly into the heart, providing a direct route to inject drugs or dye for imaging. Despite the prevailing belief that such an intrusion would cause fatal damage, Forsman's conviction was unshakable. Unable to sway skeptical seniors and get a human trial approved, he decided to act as both doctor and patient, completely confident in his hypothesis. The day to put it to the test finally came in 1929. He persuaded a surgical nurse, Gerda Ditson, to assist him by lying to her about an operating room emergency, not revealing his actual plan until the ball was already rolling. After calming down a shocked Ditson, he sterilized both arms and a catheter, numbed his arm with local anesthetic and proceeded to insert the catheter into the vein in his elbow. Using a set of mirrors, Forsman successfully guided the catheter, pushing it an unprecedented 60 centimeters up his vein and towards his heart. To prove the success of the procedure, he climbed two flights of stairs to the hospital's radiology department to take an x-ray, which showed the catheter lodged in his right atrium. Despite a mild discomfort, he had no significant pain or negative effects, firmly validating his bold hypothesis. This pioneering experiment laid the foundation for cardiac catheterization, a technique that has saved countless lives and advanced the understanding and treatment of heart diseases. It made possible a range of diagnostic procedures and treatments, including angiograms, stent insertions, and balloon angioplasties. Forsman's experiment, though viewed as reckless at the time, Time is now hailed as a milestone in the field of invasive cardiology. However, Forsman's groundbreaking discovery was initially met with censure and skepticism. His superiors chastised his recklessness, leading him to abandon his promising career in cardiology. He then served as a medical officer during World War II, and after the war, he became a country doctor, almost forgotten by the medical community. But decades later, his audacity was finally recognized. In 1956, Werner Forsman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine alongside Andre F. Cunard and Dickinson W. Richards, who had further developed his technique. In his acceptance speech, he was nothing if not humble, stating, Seldom can it happen that the acknowledgement for a scientific achievement rewards the deserved more than in our case. But given the incredible scope of his discovery and the fact that he laid his own life on the line to prove it, we think a bit of arrogance is uh, well earned in his case. 